Thank you very much. So, Dr. Sami, what do you think we should move on to uh, the last talk of this uh, session by Professor Bassam Addas? And we can have more time for discussion after Dr. Bassam's talk. Yes, yeah, sure. Amazing talks, actually. Uh, I really enjoyed it. So, uh, yeah, we could move on to the next, please. So uh, I would like to invite Professor Bassam Addas, who is uh, uh, a professor of neurosurgery and peripheral nerve surgery and epilepsy surgery at uh, King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah. Uh, professor Bassam has been kind to, to us very well because he comes uh, uh, very frequently to educate us about peripheral nerve uh, anatomy. And if you do spine surgery, you see so many patients where you need a strong knowledge about peripheral nerve to be able to uh, practice safely. So Dr. Bassam, kindly you can share your presentation. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Tamam. Uh, I'm sorry, there may, there may be some uh, glitches in the format, but uh, I hope it will uh, it will deliver the uh, the message so um, first of all i would like to thank uh, the organizing committee and dr habib for this wonderful opportunity um, dr habib asked me to talk about the anatomy of the brachial plexus but he very um uh, yani very wisely pointed on the points stressing on the point to stress on the points that are relevant to spine surgeons or uh, um uh, the, different, the, dif the differences or the differentiation between the, um, the root versus the nerve versus the entrapments, which I think is a great idea. Now, that's why I call it neuroanatomical basis of neck and arm pain. Now, I'd like to remind you that I'm not here to teach, but just to share with you some thoughts. Our objective, as I mentioned, is to use the brachial plexus anatomy to go over the differential diagnosis of radiculopathy versus nerve entrapments. Uh, that's basically how you differentiate C5 from an axillary nerve, how you, um, how you differentiate uh, C5 from an axillary nerve, how you differentiate C6 from musculocutaneous nerve, or more, more importantly, from CTS and how to differentiate C7 from radial, and again, more importantly, from CTS, because C6 and C7 does not confuse us with musculocutaneous or radial, as it's popularly uh, 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 known. It's the CTS that you need to, uh, to make the differentiation from. And we will talk about also the rare uh, 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 radiculopathies like C8 and, uh, and T1, and how we uh, tease those away from uh, uh, ulnar neuropathy. When you see the, this asterisk, it means that this is my own opinion. So you can take it or you can throw it in the garbage, it's up to you. Now, um, uh, you know most of what I will say today. Actually, you have, uh, you have most of you have studied this extensively. And um, most of what I will mention today is also a basic knowledge. Uh, some of this knowledge, uh, uh, are not new, but some of you may not be sure about, and uh, they don't know where to find it, uh, or they want to hear it from someone uh, else just to reinforce it. And um, at the end, I would say, please don't hesitate if you have any questions. There are no stupid questions, but there are lots of stupid answers. I hope I won't give you any today. Now, um, believe it or not, the anatomy of the brachial plexus is very complex. I won't say, oh, it's easy if you, no, no, it's quite complex. And it's not what you see in the books. Um, what you see in the books is not what we see in surgery. Now, variations are common. Actually, variations are the, uh, the rule rather than the exceptions. In the brachial plexus, there are no redundant nerves. That is to say that you cannot divide the nerve to improve your exposure. That does not, uh, we don't have this luxury in brachial plexus uh, anatomy. Now remember also this area is full of major arteries, major veins. Even 
the small arteries and those and the small veins will come from major arteries and will come or will drain to major veins. So you have to be careful when you're dealing with them. If they if the, you evolve them, everybody will be in trouble. Now um, I cannot help but but to mention few non spine related uh, uh, points just to um, to to make up the, the whole picture clear. Now there is a traction injury that the nerve roots may suffer, and you will find in the literature this referred to as rupture. Now, when we hear the word rupture, we believe, we, we think of something is pulled from another thing. This is not the case in, uh, in brachial plexus. The word ruptured root means that the axons inside the root are ruptured, but the sleeve is intact. And that's why we use the the notation neuroma in continuity. And this is important because these, these injuries will have the potential to recover spontaneously compared to the other injuries that you have to explore, stab injuries or laceration injuries from a knife or a glass needs to be explored early and there is no point of waiting. The same as avulsion injuries. Avulsion is, is a term that is unique for the roots. And that means that the new roots are pulled out of the spinal cord. And again, those have no chance for spontaneous recovery and waiting is not a wise thing. Now, let's go over this and we will go over it when we uh, go over the differential diagnosis. Now, C5 and C6, C7, C8, and T1 forms the brachial plexus. C5 will give some branches, the dorsal scapular nerve that goes to the rhomboids. And it contributes also to the phrenic nerve. C5, 6, and 7 will give you the long thoracic nerve. These nerves are important to differentiate the avulsion injuries from the rupture injuries. Again, avulsion, you need to go in, rupture, you can wait and give a chance for spontaneous recovery. Because these branches are too proximal, their involvement indicates an evolution injury. Then C5 and C6 forms the upper trunk, C7 continues as a middle trunk, and C8 and T1 forms the lower trunk or the inferior trunk. And each one of those trunks divides into anterior and posterior division. The upper trunk has an important branch called the suprascapula. It goes to the supra and infraspinatus muscles. The middle and the inferior trunks don't have other branches than the divisions. All the divisions are formed behind the clavicle, which is an oblique structure. It's not a straight structure as you all think. And as you know, all the posterior cord, all the posterior divisions forms the posterior cord and the anterior forms different cords. The anterior continue with the anterior of the middle trunk to form the lateral cord that gives the musculocutaneous and gives the lateral division of the median nerve. The lateral division of the median nerve with the medial division of the median nerve forms the medial nerve. Each one of those divisions carry certain axons. The axons that are carried in the lateral division goes to the pronator teres and goes to the flexor carpi radialis. But the most important that it travels through this division are the sensation to the hand, to the palm. Those three and a half fingers sensation comes from C7, anterior division, lateral cord, lateral division, median. Most of the muscles, the rest, the, the rest of the muscles of the median nerve comes actually from the medial cord. So all the intrinsics of the hand, the median nerve innervated, the flexor superficialis, the flexor profundus, all these comes from the medial cord. Now, we will leave the rest 
to the differential diagnosis. But before we leave that, I just want to, to show you here an important two nerves that are important in the localization and can cause some confusion. These are the medial brachial and the medial antibrachial or the medial, medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. Remember, because these are two separate nerves arises directly from the medial cord and supplies the medial surface of the arm and the forearm. And we'll see why this is important uh, in the differential diagnosis. Now, again, look how beautiful this is and look how complicated this is. And uh, this is the supraclavicular nerves, infraclavicular, and this is the clavicle in between. It's quite intimidating and can be, uh, um, and would take time to master. One point I would like to mention, C5 and C6 has a peculiar attachment to the shoot. The shoot is basically the transverse process. And um, this, this, uh, these two roots has a, a, a tough, a particularly C5 has a tough fibrous attachment that holds C5 into the shoot. And that's why C5 and C6 suffers more rupture injuries compared to the evulsion injuries that C8 and T1 suffers because C8 and T1 don't have this fibrous attachment. Now, let's, uh, let's try to finish uh, uh, item by item or modality by modality. Sensory examination is, it can be really difficult, but we are lucky to have what we call the dermatomal maps. So these are maps that were done more than 100 years ago, and that shows every dermatomal distribution. And on the left side, you have the dermatomal distribution, and on the right side, you have the different branches. These different branches are not important for you uh, to know at this level, but the dermatomal are important to, to, to memorize. I'm, I'm sorry to say yes, to memorize. And even with these dermatomal maps, there are mistakes. So you have to be careful. We all agree that C5 does not extend all the way to the forearm. However, this is the only uh, uh, map I'm aware of that shows both uh, roots and uh, nerves together. Now let's get to some clinical points. Um, C6 is the thumb, C7 is the index and the middle finger, and C8 is the ring and the little finger. When you look at dermatomes, it's different when you look at nerves. Now, although there are no fine or uh, um, uh, easy differentiation between the two, there are two consistent findings here. One is that the ulnar nerve splits the little finger, whereas C8 will include the little and the ring finger. I can tell you that this is very consistent finding and it's very difficult to find an ulnar nerve injury with loss of, the sen or loss of sensation in the whole ring finger. Now, some would agree that this is C6 with the, with, the, uh, with the index, and some would say, no, the index belongs to C7. That confusion came simply because the, we had two dermatomal maps, all dermatomal maps. You can see here that the index is with C6, and in this one, the index is with C7. So how can I tell that apart? Look, the easiest way, if the, th if the, if the middle finger is included with the index, that's C7 radiculopathy. And if the thumb is included with the index finger, that is C, that is C6. So it's variable, it can be C6 and C7, and be flexible, don't be rigid. Now, the sensory examination, that's my opinion, is again, is difficult. And all what you need is to ask the patient using one finger, where is the pain or where is the numbness? 
just one finger. Otherwise, they will say the whole hand. And this is a gentleman with documented C7 radiculopathy due to C6, 7 the cervical disc, was operated and patient did well. And this is a, a nurse with L5 radiculopathy, again with L4, 5 disc, operated, did well. And that saves you lots of time and prevent uh, and avoid uh, uh, mistakes if you go in and you try to pinprick and or use uh, uh, whatever instruments to, uh, to try to find uh, um, the territory of each wound. I cannot help it without saying, if you have a sensory alteration of the upper hand, even in severe diabetics, it's not diabetes. So don't fill into that trap. Diabetic neuropathy will affect the lower limb much more than the upper limb. And again, that's my opinion. Peripheral neuropathy, again, can confuse the lumbar radiculopathy and not the cervical. It's important to remember that hypothyroid is a risk factor for CTS. So in a way that it can give you a positive electrical findings, even in asymptomatic patients and can confuse you uh, uh, with cervical radiculopathy. My first advice is to learn your diseases well. Learn the cervical disc herniation, how they present, and the carpal tunnel, the cubital tunnel. Sometimes it's enough to say, well, this is not cervical disc herniation. I don't know what it is, but it's not cervical disc. I don't know why the patient is having rest pain, but it's not carpal tunnel. So, and um, neurosurgeons need to learn a little bit about the other causes of upper limb pain. Rotator cuff pathology is quite common. And maybe if we do statistics, it's more common than the cervical radiculopathy. Decurvient tenosynovitis confuses you sometimes with C6 radiculopathy or sometimes with seven, uh, C7 radiculopathy, lateral epicondylitis. And um, pain at the thumb, the base of the thumb is more common due to carpometacarpal uh, 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 joint arthritis, that's very common. And uh, other uh, 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 rest diseases can be useful to know. Remember that C5 and C8 are very rare. Carpal tunnel and cupital tunnel are more, much more common. Significant weakness or sensory loss are not usually seen in the common reticulopathy like C7 and C6. C7, C7 patients will not have a recognizable or detectable deficit, maybe a little bit of numbness in the in, in the uh, in the uh, in the middle finger, but no weakness. Now, weakness can be found in C5 and C8. Luckily, they are rare. C5 will affect the deltoid. The deltoid, although it's a big muscle, but C5 also supplies lots of muscles around the shoulder. The shoulder is heavy, and weakness can be detected. C8, on the contrary supplies very fine, small hand, small muscles that can become weak quicker than the big uh, uh, muscles. Now, neck pain, as it radiates down to the medial scapular region, can be very tricky to differentiate C5 and 6 and 7, but it helps me to indicate that this, there is a cervical origin of the pain. So before we uh, lose time, let's, let's see how can we differentiate C5 from axillary nerve. Remember, sensory and reflex examination is not reliable in these cases. There are so many muscles that are supplied by the C5. Rhomboids, suprascapular, flexocarpia radialis, pronate arteries with different nerves. But the easiest and the simplest muscle to check is the biceps. If the biceps is involved, that is not axillary nerve, as simple as this. You can examine the rest of the muscles, but if the biceps is involved, that's enough. It indicates that C5 is also involved, is involved because C5 supplies both, both the deltoid and the uh, uh, biceps, but the axillary nerve only supplies the deltoid. Now, C6 radiculopathy. 
Sometimes it may confuse you with musculocutaneous nerve. But again, remember that the most important differential is the carpal tunnel. Now, carpal tunnel is a bilateral disease. So if you see that the patient, if you hear the patients complaining of both hands, don't jump to the spine. It still can be the carpal tunnel, which again is much more common than the, uh, 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 than the cervical radiculopathy. If the patient is complaining of thumb and index pain, that's fine. But if they complain of numbness, this is more localizing. Remember, numbness has a better localizing value than pain. Pain is very nonspecific. Now, also remember that the patients with carpal tunnel will complain of the whole hand very often. We don't know why, but they complain of the whole hand. And even if you stress in, the, uh, in, the, in questioning them, they will tell you the whole hand. And believe it or not, when we do the decompression, they, have, they, they get relief of both the medial and the ulnar uh, compartment. Again, we don't know why. Now, classic, of course, the three and a half fingers but they will never only complain of the little and the ring finger. Again, if you have a patient with only thumb pain, remember uh, the other pathologies, the curvian and the arthritis of the, and the tema. Now, I always uh, want to point that patients with long-standing carpal tunnel will have atrophy of the abductor pollicis brevis, and the abductor pollicis brevis is located at the radial aspect of the, of the thumb. And this is the only median nerve exclusively supplied muscle because the flexor pollicis brevis and the opponent's pollicis are supplied by the median and the ulnar nerve. And this is the muscle that the um, electromyographers will need. Of. C7 radiculopathy is a very nice uh, 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 syndrome actually, because patients don't present with any deficits. If you are lucky again, they will uh, tell you that they have numbness in this finger. And again, the finger of C7 is the anterior and the posterior, is the volar and the dorsal. The carpal tunnel will involve the volar surface only. So if you have a smart patient and if you have, if you take your time, the patient will tell you that the patient comes from uh, from the neck goes, and they will always point to the dorsum of the forearm. And, uh, um, and if you are lucky, they would have numbness in the middle finger. You can see that C7 is redundant because the major contributions to the posterior cord, axillary, and radial nerves comes from the rest of the brachial plexus. And believe it or not, in rare cases, we can cut C7 to use it from the other side to re, uh, reconstruct the plexus of uh, uh, a severe plexus injury. Now, I agree that sometimes absent triceps reflex can help. Remember, reflexes are only useful when they are absent. C8 is rare. I have seen a couple during my career. Probably you've seen more. However, if you look here, C8 and T1 forms the ulnar nerve and forms the lat medial division of the median nerve. And these two nerves supplies the thinner and the hypothenar muscles. Now, to differentiate between, to differentiate between, um, to differentiate between ulnar neuropathy and C8, trust me, if you use this, it's quite useful. And again, patients usually tells you this. This is a gentleman who had cervical myelopathy, which is usually the which is usually the confusing syndrome. It's not C8 radiculopathy. Patients with C5, 6 level cervical myelopathy would complain of numbness along the medial aspect of the arm. So we're asking him here now, this is after surgery. I brought him back to take this video and um, he can, he would tell you clearly. 
He's complaining of the little and ring finger. And look, and also, you don't see this with ulnar neuropathy, this stiffness. And of course, he was uh, uh, clearly uh, hyper uh, reflexic. And again, you see this is ulnar, only the thinner muscles, and this is C8, both median and ulnar. T1 is very rare, and when you see T1, think of cervical rib. Very often, you have the fullness of the supraclavicular region, and you can feel the cervical rib, and very often, the cervical uh, uh, rib is, is basically pushing T1 quite anteriorly, and um, patients presents with both median and uh, uh, and uh, uh, both median and ulnar innervated uh, intrinsic. The last thing I want to say, I wish if we don't have to say this, sometimes you do all your homework well, you do your examination well, you don't miss any points, but you are confused because something didn't make sense. So I had this patient with clearly C6-7 uh, disc herniation, large one compressing C7 nerve root, but the patient is complaining of symptoms along C8 dermatomes. And luckily I know that there is something called prefixed and postfixed chiasm. This means basically that in the, the, the plexus is shifted up or down one level. So you compress what looks like C7, it produces C8 uh, clinical picture, or you compress C6 in the prefix and it causes C5 uh, uh, clinical picture. Now, don't take this as an excuse every time you, uh, you, know, you try to twist uh, the neck of the images, uh, but it, it does exist. And uh, again, when you have no other explanation, of course, uh, that can be uh, uh, the cause. Thank you again for accommodating me and, and sorry for going over time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Adas. This was um, fantastic. And uh, I would like to entertain questions. Um, we'll start with the uh, questions and answers. Uh, somebody asked what's evulsion and why we wait for spontaneous recovery. Yeah, so evulsion, we don't wait for spontaneous recovery. I Sorry if I misspoken, but I, rupture, you wait. Because in rupture, there is, you still have the, the nerve root in rupture. You still have the nerve root in the, 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 um, the basically <laughs> the Schwann cells, the, the, the root is in continuity. So the axons may repair themselves. In evulsion, you disconnected the, the root from the spinal cord. In evulsions and in lacerations, we don't wait. In traction, we wait, giving the chance for spontaneous recovery. If after a period of observation, no spontaneous recovery took place, we go in. Because the rupture can be so dense and severe, making it, it basically as a transaction. If no accidents can go through the fibrous tissue. Thank you. I, I, I do have... Uh, two or three questions, Dr. Uh, Adas. Uh, the fibrous attachment at C5-6, the shoot, do these explain the C5 radiculopathy following cervical laminectomy, uh, or at least part of it? Uh, excellent. Uh, you know, when I reviewed that topic, uh, I can see the, um, that most of the literature, the spine literature, focuses on a compression etiology as the cause of C5. Now, when you do an anterior cervical procedure and you try to restore the lordosis, sometimes that pinches the foramen, the nerve at the foramen. Um, and also we don't know what in OPLL, why it's more common in OPLL. There is no traction when you perform these surgeries. Correct me if I'm wrong. So this is, this can explain that if the energy or if the mechanism is traction, but it seems like most of the cases of C5 palsy post-spine surgery 
are due to compression etiology. That's my understanding. Um, Dr. Adas, we are coming to an end. Uh, there are questions on the Q&A. Uh, kindly, they are, all, they are all directed to you. Can you, uh, because we're gonna have to go into break now for 20 minutes. Can you yeah. go into the Q&A? You might wanna answer them one by one. There are only three, three or uh, four, actually five. There's a lot of interest in your talk. Uh, can you go on the Q&A and uh, uh, answer them? I will, I will, I will. Thank you very much, thank you very uh, much.